Morning, said Hagrid to a fig goblin. We've come to take some money out of Mr Harry Potter's safe. You have his key, sir? Got it here somewhere, said Hagrid, and he started emptying his pockets onto the counter, scattering a handful of mouldy dog biscuits over the goblin's book of numbers. The goblin wrinkled his nose. Harry watched the goblin on their right, weighing a pile of rubies as big as glowing coals. Got it, said Hagrid at last, holding up a tiny golden key. The goblin looked at it closely. That seems to be an order. And I've also got a letter here from Professor Dumbledore, said Hagrid importantly, throwing out his chest. It's about, you know what, in Vault 713. The goblin read the letter carefully. Very well, he said, handing it back to Hagrid. I'll have someone take you down to the vaults. Grip Hook? Grip Hook was yet another goblin. Once Hagrid had crammed all the dog biscuits back inside his pockets, he and Harry followed Grip Hook towards one of the doors leading off the hall. What's the you know what in Vault 713? Harry asked. Can't tell you that, said Harry, Hagrid mysteriously. Very secret, Hogwarts business. Dumbledore's trusted me. More than my job's worth, tell you that. Grip Hook held the door open for them. Harry, who had expected more marble, was surprised. They were in a narrow stone passageway lit with flaming torches. It sloped steeply downwards and there was a little railway track on the floor. Grip Hook whistled and a small cart came hurtling up the tracks towards them. They climbed in, Hagrid with some difficulty, and were off. At first they just hurtled for a maze of twisting passages. Harry tried to remember. Left, right, right, left, middle fork, right, left, but it was impossible. The rattling cart seemed to know its own way because Grip Hook wasn't steering. Harry's eyes stung as the cold air rushed past them, but he kept them wide open. Once he thought he saw a burst of fire at the end of a passage and twisted around to see if it was a dragon, but too late, they plunged even deeper, passing an underground lake where huge telecities and staglomites grew from the ceiling and floor. I never know, Harry called to Hagrid over the noise of the cart. What's the difference between a staglomite and a stalocyte? Staglomite's got an M in it, said Hagrid. And don't ask me questions just now, I think I'm going to be sick. He did look very green, and when the cart stopped at last beside a small door in the passage wall, Hagrid got out and had leaned against the wall to stop his knees trembling. Grip Hook unlocked the door. A lot of green smoke came blowing out, and, it, and as it cleared, Harry gasped. Inside were mounds of gold coins, columns of silver, heaps of little bronze nuts. All yours, smiled Hagrid. All Harry's, it was incredible. The Dursleys couldn't have known about this, or they'd have had it from him faster than blinking. How often had they complained about how much Harry cost them to keep? And all the time there had been a small fortune belonging to him buried deep under London. Hagrid helped Harry pile some of it into a bag. The gold ones are galleons, he explained. Seventeen silver sickles to a galleon and twenty-nine nuts to a sickle. It's easy enough. Right, that should be enough for a couple of turns. We'll keep the rest safe for yeah? He turned to Grip Hook. Vault 713 now, please. And can we go more slowly? One speed only, said Grip Hook. They were going even deeper now, gathering speed. The air became colder and colder as they hurtled round tight corners. They went rattling over an underground ravine and Harry leant over the side to try and see what was down at the dark bottom that Hagrid groaned and pulled him back by the scruff of his neck. Vault 713 had no keyhole. Stand back, said Grip Hook importantly. He stroked the door gently with one of his long fingers and it simply melted away. If anyone but a Gringotts goblin tried that, they'd be sucked through the door and trapped in there, said Grip Hook. How often do you check to see if anyone's inside? Harry asked. About once every ten years, said Grip Hook, with a rather nasty grin. Someone really extraordinary had to be inside this top secret vault. Harry was sure, 
and he leant forward eagerly, expecting to see fabulous jewels at the very least. But at first he thought it was empty. Then he noticed a grubby little package wrapped in brown paper lying on the floor. Hagrid picked it up and tucked it deep inside his coat. Harry longed to know what it was, but he knew better than to ask. Come back. Come on, back in this infernal cart and don't talk to me on the way back. It's best if I can keep my mouth shut, said Hagrid. One wild cart ride later, they stood blinking in the sunlight outside Gringotts. Harry didn't know where to run first now that he had a bag full of money. He didn't know to... He didn't have to know how many galleons there were to the pound to know that he was holding more money than he'd had in his whole life, more money than even Dudley had ever had. Might as well get your uniforms, said Hagrid, nodding toward Madame Malkin's robes for all occasions. Listen, Harry, would you? Mind if I slip out for a pick-me-up in the leaky cauldron? I ate them green cocks carts. He did still look a bit sick, so Harry entered Madame Malkin's shop alone, feeling nervous. Madame Malkin was a squat, smiling witch, dressed in all mauve. Hogwarts, dear, she said, when Harry started to speak. Got the lot here, another young man being fitted up just now, in fact. In the back of the shop, a boy with a pale, pointed face was standing on a footstool, while a second witch pinned up his long black robes. Madame Malkin stood Harry on a stool next to him, slipped a long robe over his head and began to pin it to the right length. Hello, said the boy. Hogwarts too? Yes, said Harry. My father's next door buying my books and my mother's up the street looking at wands, said the boy. He had a bored, drawling voice. Then I'm going to drag them off and to look at racing brooms. I don't see why first years can't have their own. I think I'll bully father into getting one, and I'll smuggle it in somehow. Harry was strongly reminded of Dudley. Have you got your own broom? the boy went on. No, said Harry. Play Quidditch at all? No, Harry said, wondering what on earth Quidditch could be. I do. Father says it's a crime if I'm not picked to pay for my house, and I must say I agree. Know what house you'll be in yet? No said Harry, feeling more stupid by the minute. Well, no one really knows until they get there, do they? But I know I'll be in Slytherin, all our family have been. Imagine being in Huffle Hufflepuff. I think I'd leave, wouldn't you? Hmm, said Harry, wishing he could say something a bit more interesting. I say, look at that man, said the boy, suddenly nodding towards the front window. Hagrid was standing there, grinning at Harry and pointing at two large ice creams to show he couldn't come in. That's Hagrid, said Harry, pleased to know something the boy didn't. He works at Hogwarts. Oh, said the boy. I've heard of him. He's a sort of servant, isn't he? He's the gameskeeper, said Harry. He was liking the boy less and less every second. Yes, exactly. I heard he's sort of savage. Lives in a hut in the school grounds, and every now and then he gets drunk, tries to do magic, then ends up setting fire to his bed. I think he's brilliant, said Harry coldly. Do you? said the boy with a slight sneer. Why is he with you? Where are your parents? They're dead, said Harry shortly. He didn't feel much like going into the matter with this boy. Oh, sorry, said the other, not sounding sorry at all. But they were our kind, weren't they? They were a witch and the wizard, if that's what you mean. I don't really think they should let the other sort in, do you? They're just not the same. They've never been brought up to know our ways. Some of them have never even heard of Hogwarts until they get the letter. Imagine! I think they should keep it in the old wizarding, wizarding families. What's your surname, anyway? But before Harry could answer, Madame Malkin said, That's you done, my dear, said Har and Harry not sorry for an excuse to stop talking to the boy, hopped down from the footstool. Well, I'll see you at Hogwarts, I suppose, said the drawling boy. Harry was rather quiet as he ate his ice cream. Hagrid had bought him chocolate and raspberry with chopped nuts. What's up? said Hagrid. Nothing, lied Harry. They stopped to buy parchment and quills. Harry cheered up a bit when he found a bottle of ink that changed colour as you wrote. When they'd left the shop, he said, Hagrid, 
What's Quidditch? Blimey, Harry, I keep forgetting how Lytton, you know. Not knowing about Quidditch. Don't make me feel worse, said Harry. He told Hagrid about the pale boy and Madame Malkins. And he said people from muggle families shouldn't even be allowed in. You're not from a muggle family. If he'd known who you were, he'd grown up knowing your name if his parents are Whittington folk. You saw him in the leaky cauldron. Anyway, what does he know about it? Some of the best I ever saw were only the ones with magic in them in a long line of muggles. Look at your mum. Look what she had for a sister. So what is Quidditch? It's our sport, wizard sport. It's like, like football in the muggle world. Everyone follows Quidditch. Played up in the air on broomsticks and there's four balls. Sort of hard to explain the rules. And what are Slytherin and Hufflepuff? Schoolhouses, there's four. Everyone says Hufflepuff are a lot like old duffers, but... I bet I'm in Hufflepuff, said Harry gloomily. Better Hufflepuff than Slytherin, said Harry, and um, said Hagrid darkly. There's not a single witch or wizard who went bad who wasn't in Slytherin. You know who was one. Vol, sorry, you know who was at Hog Hogwarts? Years and years ago, said Hagrid. They bought Harry's school books in a shop called Flourish and Blots, where the shelves were stacked to the ceiling with books as large as paving stones, bound in leather. Books the size of postage stamps in covers of silk. Books full of peculiar symbols and a few books with nothing in them at all. Even Dudley, who never read anything, would have been wild to get his hands on some of these. Hagrid almost had to drag Harry away from curses and counter-curses, bewitch your friends and befuddle your enemies with the latest revenges, hair loss, jelly legs, tongue tying and much, much more by Professor Vindicus Viridon. I was trying to find out how to curse Dudley. <laughs> I'm not saying that's not a good idea, but you're not to use magic in the model world, except in very special circumstances, said Hagrid. And anyway, you couldn't work any of them curses yet. You'll need a lot more study before you get to that level. <laughs> Hagrid wouldn't let Harry buy a solid gold cauldron either. It says pewter on your list. But they got a nice set of scales for weighing portion ingredients and a collapsible brass telescope. Then they visited the apothecaries, which was fascinating enough to make up for its horrible smell, a mixture of bad eggs and rotted cabbages. Barrels of slimy stuff stood on the floor, jars of herbs and dried roots and bright powders lined the wall. Bundles of feathers, strings of fangs and snarled claws hung from the ceiling. While Hagrid asked the man behind the counter for a supply of some basic potion ingredients for Harry, Harry himself examined silver unicorn's horns at 21 galleons each and minuscule, glittery, black beetle eyes, five nuts a scoop. Outside the apothecaries, Hagrid checked Harry's list again. Just your wand left. Oh yeah, and I still haven't got you a birthday present. Harry felt himself go red. You don't have to. I know I don't have to. Tell you what, I'll get you an animal. Not a toad. Toads went out of fashion years ago. You'll be laughed at. And I don't like cats. They make me sneeze. I'll get you an owl. All the kids want an owl. They're dead useful. Carry a post and everything. 20 minutes later, they left Elop's Owl Emporium, which had been dark and full of rustling and flickering jewel bright eyes. Harry now carried a large cage which held a beautiful snowy owl fast asleep with her head under her wing. He couldn't stop stammering his thanks, sounding just like Professor Quirrell. Don't mention it, said Harry gruffly. Don't expect you've had a lot of presents from them Dursleys. Just Ollivander's left now. The only place for wands, Olivander's. And yeah, gotta have the best wand. A magic wand, this was what Harry had really been looking forward to. The last shop was narrow and shabby. Peeling gold letters over the door leave a love, uh, Ollivander's, makers of fine wands since 382 BC. A single wand lay on a faded black cushion in the dusty window. A tinkling bell rang somewhere in the depth of the shop as they stepped inside. It was a tiny place empty except for a single spindly chair which Harry Hagrid sat on to wait. He swallowed a lot of new questions which had just occurred to him 
and looked instead at the thousands of narrow boxes piled neatly up to the ceiling. For some reason, the back of his neck prickled. The very dust and silence in here seemed to tingle with some secret magic. Good afternoon, said a soft voice. Harry jumped. Hagrid must have jumped too, because there was a loud crunching noise and he quickly got off the spindly chair. An old man was standing before them, his wide, pale eyes shining like moons through the gloom of the shop. Hello, said Harry awkwardly. Ah, yes, said the man. Yes, yes, I thought I would be seeing you soon. Harry Potter. It wasn't a question. You have your mother's eyes. It seems only yesterday she was in her, in her, herself, buying her first wand. Ten and a quarter inches long, swishy, made of willow. Nice wand for charm work. Mr. Ollivander moved closer to Harry. Harry wished he could blink. Those silvery eyes were a bit creepy. Your father, on the other hand, favoured a mahogany wand. Eleven inches. Pliable. A more little, a little more power and excellent for transfiguration. Well, I say your father favoured it. It's really the wand that chooses the wizard, of course. Mr. Ollivander had come so close that he and Harry were almost nose to nose. Harry could see himself reflected in those misty eyes. And that's where Mr. Ollivander touched the lightning scar on Harry's forehead with a long white finger. I'm sorry to say I sold the wand that did it, he said softly. Thirteen and a half inches. You, powerful wand, very powerful. And in the wrong hands. Well, if I'd known what that wand was going to do into the world, to do. He shook his head and then, to Harry's relief, spotted Hagrid. Rubius, Rubius Hagrid, how nice to see you again. Oak, 16 inches, rather bendy, wasn't it? It was, sir, yes, said Hagrid. Good wand, that one. But I suppose they snapped it in half when you got expelled, said Mr. Ollivander, suddenly stern. Uh, yes, they did, yes, said Hagrid, shuffling his feet. I've still got the pieces, though, he added brightly. But you don't use them, Mr. Ollivander said sharply. Oh, no, said, oh, no, sir, said Hagrid quickly. Harry noticed his grip his pink umbrella very tightly as he spoke. Hmm, said Mr. Ollivander, giving Hagrid a piercing look. Well now, Mr. Potter, let me see. He pulled a long tape measure with silver markings out of his pocket. Which is your wand arm? Uh, well, I'm right-handed, said Harry. Hold out your arm. That's it. He measured Harry from shoulder to finger, then wrist to elbow, shoulder to floor, knee to armpit and around his head. As he measured, he said, every Ollivander wand has a core of a powerful magical substance, Mr Potter. We use unicorn hairs, phoenix tail feathers and the heartstrings of dragons. No two Ollivander wands are the same, just as no two unicorns, dragons or phoenixes are quite the same. And of course you will never get good, such good results with another wizard's wand. Harry suddenly realised that the tape measure which was measuring between his nostrils was doing this on his own. Mr Ollivander was fitting around the shelves, taking down boxes. That will do, he said, and the tape measure crumpled into a heap on the floor. Right then, Mr Potter, try this one. Beechwood and dragon heartstring, nine inches, nice and flexible. Just take it and give it a wave. Harry took the wand and, feeling foolish, waved it around, but Mr Ollivander snatched it out of his hand almost at once. Maple and phoenix feather, seven inches, quite whippy, try. Harry tried, but he hardly raised the wand when it too was snatched back by Mr Ollivander. No, no, here, ebony and unicorn hair, eight and a half inches, springy. Go on, go on, try it out. Harry tried and tried. He had no idea what Mr Ollivander was waiting for. The pile of tried wands was mounting higher and higher on the spindly chair, but the more wands Mr Ollivander pulled from the shelf, the happier he seemed to become. Tricky customer, eh? Not to worry. We'll find the perfect match here somewhere. I wonder now. Yes, why not? Unusual combination. Holly and phoenix feather. Eleven inches. Nice and supple. Harry took the wand. He suddenly felt, um, he felt a sudden warmth in his fingers. He raised the wand above his head. 
brought it down by swishing through the dusty air and a steam of red and gold sparks shot from the end like a firework, throwing dancing spots of light onto the wall. Hagrid whooped and clapped, and Mr Ollivander cried, Oh, bravo! Yes, indeed! Oh, very good! Well, well, well! How curious! How very curious! He put Harry's wand back into the box, and it wrapped it in a brown paper, still muttering, Curious! Curious! Sorry, said Harry, but what's curious? Mr Ollivander fixed Harry with his pale stare. I remember every wand I've ever sold, Mr Potter. Every single wand. It so happens that the phoenix whose tail feather is in your wand gave another feather, just one other. It is very curious indeed that you should be destined for this wand from its brother. Why, its brother gave you that scar. Harry swallowed. Yes, thirteen and a half inches. You. Curious indeed how these things happen. The wand chooses the wizard, remember? I think we must expect great things from you, Mr Potter. After all, he who must not be named did great things. Terrible, yes, but great. Harry shivered. He wasn't sure he liked Mr Ollivander too much. He paid seven gold galleons for his wand and Mr Ollivander bowed them from his shop. The late afternoon sun hung low in the sky as Harry and Hagrid made their way back down Diagon Alley, back through the wall. Back through the leaky cauldron, now empty. Harry didn't speak at all as they walked down the road. He didn't even notice how much people were gawping at them on the underground, laden as they were with all their funny shaped packages with the sleeping snowy owl on Harry's lap. Up another escalator, out into Paddington Station, Harry only realised where they were when Hagrid tapped him on the shoulder. Got time for a bite to eat before your train leaves, he said. He bought Harry a hamburger and they sat down on plastic seats to eat them. Harry kept looking around. Everything looked so strange somehow. You all right, Harry? You're very quiet, said Hagrid. Harry wasn't sure he could explain. He'd just had the best birthday of his life, and yet he chewed his hamburger trying to find the words. Everyone thinks I'm special, he said at last. All those people in the leaky cauldron, Professor Quirrell, Mr Ollivander, but I don't know anything about magic at all. How can they expect great things? I'm famous and I can't even remember what I'm famous for. I don't know what happened when Roll. sorry, I mean the night my parents died. Hagrid leant across the table. Behind the wild beard and eyebrows, he wore a very kind smile. Don't you worry, Harry. You'll learn fast enough. Everyone starts at the beginning at Hogwarts. You'll be just fine. Just be yourself. I know it's hard. You've been singled out, and that's always hard. But yeah, have a great time at Hogwarts. I did. Still do, matter of fact. Hagrid helped Harry onto the train that would take him back to the Dursleys, then handed him her envelope. Your ticket for Hogwarts, he said. 1st of September, King's Cross. It's all on your ticket. Any problems with the Dursleys, send me a letter with your owl. She'll know where to find me. See you soon, Harry. The train pulled out of the station. Harry wanted to watch Hagrid until he was out of sight. He rose in his seat and pressed his nose against the window, but he blinked and Hagrid was gone. <laughs>